This is a video for class 9th environmental applications and today in this video we shall cover some more terms and concepts related to basic ecology unit. Right? So the first term that we have here is habitat. Now what's a habitat? It's a physical place or locality occupied by an organism or community. All right. So any organism or a community, when they live together in a particular place, that place is referred to as their habitat. So in that particular habitat, they live, they derive their shelter, they derive their food, they fight with their enemies. So they live and die in that particular place only. And that is referred to as the habitat of that particular animal or organism. Now, habitat can be as large as a forest, as large as a desert, or it can be as small as a small pond or a puddle. So here I've given an example of a pond habitat. Here you'll have varied types of organisms living in a pond. There's a duck, there's a frog, there are different types of fish, there are different types of beetles, scorpions, liches, snails. So all these organisms live in and around the pond and this is a pond habitat. Another example is as small as a bark of a tree or a tree, tree trunk. Here also you'll find different number of animals or say insects for instance, lichens, mosses, ferns growing on a small piece of a tree trunk. So habitat can be very big and it can be as small as this tree trunk or it can be even a small burrow in the ground where organisms thrive. Then we have something called as a micro habitat. It is the further subdivision of a larger habitat. So a subtype is a micro habitat and here is an example of a mangrove habitat. So this habitat or mangrove habitat can be divided into two micro habitats that is the upper canopy or the leaves or the branches of the mangrove plant and then the roots and the bottom of the plant. So on the top or the upper canopy there will be many migratory birds living or there are local birds building their nests there. All right, Some insects living in the upper part of the canopy, snakes can thrive there. In the lower part here, around its roots, there can be different types of crabs taking shelter, different types of insects or leeches taking shelter around it. So this is your microhabitat. Mangrove is largely a habitat and it can be further divided into these two microhabitats. Then a normal tree in a jungle also has two microhabitats. One is the upper canopy and the other one is the forest floor. So you'll have many animals, birds, honeybees, insects, monkeys living in the upper canopy and around the bottom of the tree or the forest floor, there'll be many orchids, there'll be many ferns, snakes or other burrowing animals taking shelter at the tree bottom. Okay, so these are your two micro habitats. Another example can be the surface of the pond and the bottom of the pond. So the species thriving there won't be the same. Next is an ecological niche. Now what's an ecological niche? It's a functional role of an organism in relation to its food and enemies. It basically means how an organism thrive in its particular habitat how it finds its food and how it f fights with its enemies. So that entire defense mechanism and search for food and the way it lives in its environment or habitat or that particular ecosystem is termed as ecological niche. For example, here's a picture of a red squirrel which is found in the temperate regions of the world. All right. So these squirrels mostly live in coniferous forest and their food as we know it's seeds and nuts. So it hunts for its food that it's seeds and nuts and at the same time it also tries to run away from its enemies, from its predators like a huge bird or a huge owl or a hawk. So it is finding food at the same time it is also fighting with its enemies 
and that entire situation is termed as ecological niche. Here's another example of a dung beetle. All right, now we know that dung beetles are found in the warmer parts of the world, sometimes in certain temperate regions of the world, and they live on dung or animal excreta, right? So they make balls of this excreta. They move this from place to place in order to store it and mate and produce new hatchlings, all right? So these dung beetles, their food is hunting for or looking out for excreta or animal waste, making it into the balls and storing it for further use. Plus, at the same time, it also tries to run away from its predators like huge birds or smaller birds and other bigger insects. Okay, so this entire process is again known as the ecological niche. Moving on, what is succession? Now, again, this is a very important term related to basic ecology. Succession is how in a systematic orderly manner, organisms, uh, they evolve themselves at a particular place, all right, and they create such nice conditions for other organisms to thrive there. So succession begins with where there is no organism thriving before, and in initially a small organism will start living in a particular place and eventually slowly bigger animals will come and take uh, refuge in that particular place and the ecosystem will start thriving. That is known as succession. Okay. Now, for example, we have two types of succession. The first one is primary succession wherein say there's an island and there's no other living being or living uh, plants or animals thriving in that particular region. So initially, say, lichens and mosses will start growing in that particular place. Slowly, some small uh, plants and uh, small plants and bushes will start growing that to seasonal ones which don't grow throughout the year. Slowly in that region, perennial grasses or bushes and shrubs will start growing. So these are bigger plants which grow throughout the year, followed by little bigger trees and bigger plants. And then in that particular, huge trees will come into existence. So you see from nothing, the succession has grown to huge trees. All right. So the first species which start living in that particular place, they are referred to as pioneer organisms and that particular type of succession is known as primary succession. Then we have something called as secondary succession. Say a particular habitat or an ecosystem is completely destroyed by forest fires or volcanic eruptions and the new species start growing in that same place on the remains of previous biological organisms, okay? And then again, the succession begins, that is known as secondary succession. For example, in this picture, you have a forest area, a green wooded area. So there are forest fires or bush fires, which completely destroys the entire forest. So here you have nothing. Then slowly tiny grass starts appearing in that particular place followed by some bushes, shrubs, and then you have the entire habitat which grows and thrives. This is known as secondary succession. Then we have another term called ecotypes or ecospecies. These are nothing but subspecies that are adapted to a particular set of environment. So it is one single species only, but it behaves differently. It lives differently in different parts of the earth. All right. So for example, here's an Arctic fox. All right. Now, Arctic fox is found in colder regions where it snows heavily around the Arctic areas. So this is a particular Arctic lemming fox. Now, these foxes which are found in the interior parts of the continent, away from the coastal areas, they feed mostly on rodents, all right, burrowing animals. Why? These same type of Arctic foxes which are found along the coastal areas near water bodies, their food cycle is completely different. They live on the aquatic animals or they depend on aquatic animals for their food. 
so you see a single species has adopted itself in different ways in different regions so this is an a uh, subspecies of an arctic fox then you have two eco species a subspecies of bottle nose dolphin there is one type of bottle nose dolphin which you will find around the coastal areas and there is second species which you will find in very deep cold waters okay so the ones which live around the coastal areas they prefer warm water they live in shallow waters and you'll mostly able to you'll be able to spot them around lagoons all right around estuaries you'll spot them often but then you have a species which lives offshore in very deep waters cold waters and it's very difficult to spot them and their bodies are also quite huge in order to conserve heat and also to fight with other predators so here's another example of a bottlenose ecotype then we have ecotypes or subtypes of earthworms also okay so here's one type they are referred to as compost earthworms they are found mostly on the surface and they feed on warm moist compost or waste they are mostly bright red in color with stripes on their bodies okay now another ecotype or subtype of earthworms is these particular epigeic earthworms okay these are also found on the surface of the earth but they mostly feed on leaf litter and these are red in color but they don't have stripes on their bodies the third ecotype is endogeic earthworms and these earthworms make horizontal burrows in the ground all right and they are mostly grayish or very pale in color and the fourth type is anisic earthworms these make vertical burrows in the ground so whatever compost or waste enters into the burrow they feed on that so here their head is darker in color while their tail will be very of lighter tint okay so you see how a single species of earthworm has adopted itself in different ways and there are four ecotypes all right the next term that we'll discuss is species now species are organisms of one type they live only among themselves they mate or breed among their own kind and they produce a species same like them so organisms having similar characteristics and breed among their own kind are referred to as species okay now for a particular species to survive on the earth they need to have a critical minimum size when the population size of these species falls below critical minimum size they come at the verge of extinction okay if their population does not start increases they can go completely extinct they can be wiped out from the face of the earth so for organisms or species to maintain critical minimum size the birth rate should be higher than the death rate if the death rate increases then the organisms can go extinct so here you have two species of elephants here is a picture of an african elephant elephant and here you have a picture of an asian elephant african elephants have huge flappy ears which resemble the continent africa while asian elephants have smaller ears african elephants have only one dome here on their head while asian elephants have two domes here okay and these are quite bigger african elephants are quite bigger while asian elephants are smaller and they don't interbreed among themselves all right they are totally two complete different species and they live among their kinds only then what is extinction of species extinction is when a particular species completely disappears from the earth and you'll find them no way in the forest in the remote areas or even in captivity in zoos or wildlife sanctuaries when this happens that is considered as extinction species or we say that that species or particular species has gone completely extinct okay you'll find them nowhere on the earth so like this previously 
many species have gone extinct and here is a picture of dodo bird which was found mostly only on the island of Mauritius in the southern hemisphere near Africa because of human activities, because of climatic changes, dodo bird has gone extinct. You'll find it now nowhere else in the world. Then this was also a species which used to thrive many years ago on the earth but now it's, it has gone extinct that is a woolly mammoth. This is a picture of dinosaurs and there are different varieties of dinosaurs once swarming the earth and they say that because of asteroid impact or some continuous volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, natural disasters have rendered these species extinct. Then this is a picture of a saber tooth, a type of tiger which existed previously and has gone extinct now. Okay, now what causes this extinction of species? Firstly, there is competition among the animals to live in a particular habitat. They fight for food, they fight for shelter. So the animals which are very much adapted to that particular environment, which are stronger will survive and the weaker ones will eventually go extinct. Then diseases and predators. Sometimes some deadly diseases spread out into the wild or in the ecology or habitat which spread very rapidly and the animals or certain species can go extinct if they are not immune to those diseases. Sometimes the predators also which feed on certain organisms, they can grow in number and they feed on these organisms and that also can be a reason for extinction. Then there is destruction of habitats by mostly human activities, okay? We are encroaching upon the forest areas. There is unprecedented felling of trees, deforestation, uh, enlarging of urban areas, okay? Coming up with new cities, building of dams, building of roads, building of railway lines, okay? Uh, bringing more and more land under agriculture on the, safe, on the sake of these forested areas. So all these development activities lead to habitat destruction. Then there is pollution. When air, water bodies, soil or land gets contaminated, certain organisms cannot survive in those conditions and they can die. Okay, It can lead to acid rain. There can be climatic changes that affects these organisms. Okay, A very good example here is lichens. You'll find them only in the regions where there is minimal pollution or no pollution at all. In very bustling, crowded cities where the pollution level is very high, you, you, won't, find, you won't find lichens there. So lichens, they, are, they show you that the area has very, very less pollution. Then there is overhunting and poaching. Yes, humans hunt animals for their tusk, for their bones, for their fur, for their skin. For medicinal purpose also we hunt and poach animals and that has lead to decline in the species of different organisms. Then sometimes yes naturally also organisms can go extinct because of earthquakes, landslides, volcanic eruptions. They can go extinct. Alright now we know what are the reasons for extinction. What effects further chain effects can extinction have? Diminishing richness of the earth, all right? The earth is known for its biodiversity and varied organisms. So if this organism slowly start diminishing, then the earth will lose its richness. The effect on research. Yes, our medicine research, a botany, zoo research is many times based on the ecology, on the organisms and on plants. And many medicines also we derive from the plants and animals. So if these species go extinct, medical research and other research will get hampered. Then there is extinction of wild varieties at a very faster rate. Now our present food crops which we derive, actually originally, initially they grew in the wild and then we have hybridized them for our use for growing crops. So if the wild species go extinct, Food production will also get largely affected. Then loss of natural balance. 
Every organism you had learnt in the previous video had some role or the other to play into the environment, right? We have learnt about the food chain and the food web. You remove one organism and there'll be a complete imbalance. Aesthetic value of the place will be lost. That is, will be lost. That is nothing but the beauty of the place will be gone. Certain places are famous or known for their organisms, isn't it? Antarctica is known for its penguins. So if penguins go extinct, Antarctica in a way will lose its aesthetic value. Then there is loss in the medical field. As we discussed here, there will be loss in the medical field too. Alright, moving on to the next term that is exotic or introduced species. Now these are the species which actually go elsewhere but we humans introduce them in a new place for our benefit. Those are known as exotic or introduced species. Okay, so we introduce that particular species of animal or plant into a new region. For example, uh, so this is a picture of Lantana camara. This is a type of plant which grows on its own in wild, around the roadside as bushes. And it's an ornamental plant, but it, re it releases harmful toxins in the air and harms the other plants around it. It hampers the growth of other plants around it. Okay, what's the name? It's Lantana camara. Again, it's an introduced species or an exotic species. Here is a picture of a water hyacinth. Okay, we know that water hyacinth grows on the surface of river, ponds or lakes. Once they start growing or once they are introduced in a particular region, they start spreading very, very rapidly and they use all the oxygen in the water, thereby causing deficiency of oxygen for other organisms in the water. Another example of introduced species is Austri Australian Acacia. This was introduced in India for a project of afforestation. There, are, there were many places where deforestation had taken place. So this was introduced to fill those gaps or fill those areas by afforestation. But again, this doesn't allow other native species to thrive readily and it can get easily uprooted. All right. This is a species of introduced spotted deer. All right. Spotted deer was introduced by Britishers to the islands of Andaman and Nicobar. Okay. So once they were introduced there, there were no major predators to feed on these animals. So as there were no enemies, population of spotted deer started increasing drastically in the Andaman and Nicobar islands. And they started eating up all the grass and the greenery in that particular region. So the native species were driven away by spotted deers. Then this is a subabur tree again, uh, introduced species of tree, which again doesn't allow other local plants or trees to grow. All right. It utilizes also the water content from the soil and kills in, in, in a sense, it kills the other plants. Okay, so here's another example of squirrel. So this particular brown squirrel, the population of this is increasing in North America in colder regions and they are driving away these red squirrels. Again, an introduced species. Okay, then we have something called as endemic species. These are the species which are found only in restricted areas, okay? You'll find them only in certain parts of the world and you'll find them nowhere else, okay? So they are usually isolated. Maybe they are found in, in a remote high mountain or a remote jungle, which doesn't give them uh, scope to grow. That is why you'll find them only in certain parts of the world and nowhere else. So those type of species are referred to as endemic species. So if the species of endemic type starts decreasing, then it's a major threat because you won't find them in the other parts of the world. They can get easily extinct. So it's our role and duty to protect these endemic species. Some examples of endemic species are polar bears, 
polar bears are only found around the arctic areas and they are found nowhere else in the world but because of climate change their population is drastically decreasing then penguins as i just discussed they are found only around or in antarctica and nowhere else in the world there are few species which are found in the southern part of africa but these particular emperor penguins you'll find them only in antarctica again an endemic species giant panda we know that they are found only in parts of china and they feed on bamboo okay now you'll say that you have seen pandas in other parts of the world but they have been introduced elsewhere by us but naturally they are found only in china then we have kangaroos which are endemic only to australia now this is a giant salamander which is or a komodo dragon this is a komodo dragon which is found only in the indonesian islands you'll find them nowhere else in the world so it's endemic only to indonesia so here's a kiwi bird which is found only in new zealand so like this those were the endemic species and then lastly we have something called as keystone species these are the species whose presence and absence makes a huge difference in the environment or ecology because they in a kind they balance the ecosystem or habitat for example we have the tiger shark now tiger sharks feed on sea turtles sea turtles feed on sea grass right now if the tiger sharks go completely extinct or they die say for suppose then the population of sea turtles will start increasing sea turtles further will consume all the sea grass and that's why other fish won't have enough food in the sea so presence of tiger shark is of utmost importance to maintain a balance so these type of species are known as keystone species which play a very very important role in the environment then you have crocodiles when crocodiles are newly born they are very tiny and small so birds hawks or even snakes and bigger fish feed on these tiny crocodiles but when these crocodiles grow in size when they become bigger they in turn eat the same snakes birds and fish okay so like this balance is maintained then we have black tailed prairie dog this is a type of rodent which is found in the grasslands of canada and usa and these burrow in the ground and they live in these burrows all right so they keep on moving from place to place burrowing into the soil these burrows are further used by other rodents and this is a food for many coyotes or wolves or other carnivores plus these organisms by digging or burrowing in the, into the soil in a way they aerate the soil they make the soil fertile in a way they they pulverize the soil so here these species again play a very very important role in the environment all right and lastly we have something called as ficus species again a type of keystone species like banyan or peepal tree okay so these ficus species are trees which produce tiny berries all right so and if many animals are dependent on these huge trees isn't it birds monkeys snakes lives in these trees and these berries they are home to a particular type of wasp this particular type of wasp it lays eggs inside these berries all right these eggs hatch and turn into a larva inside these berries only inside this fix only so if these trees get completely destroyed those particular type of wasps or insects also will get completely destroyed so as i said every organism plays a very important role but there'll be one single organism which kind of balances everything and those are known as keystone species thank you this is it for today